take that as somebody who planted a seed and keeps on watering and the magic that you all know she does as each and every one of you contribute. It's my pleasure to invite up Elizabeth May. Thank you. Thank you. And to my friend Russell Cookstrom, to my friend Lorraine Megwich, to Avery Wallalan, to my friends in St. Chosen Haishka Siam. It is indeed an honor to be here to give a keynote address on a Saturday night when we've had such a rich, very rich, more than 24 hours with tomorrow yet to come. And there's much to say and much to reflect on. Of course, I want to start by acknowledging my immense gratitude at, on being welcomed to the territory of the Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam, and Squamish First Nations and again, to recognize their leadership in the fight that we've been fighting together to make sure the Kinder Morgan Pipeline, which I should think we should now rename officially the Trudeau Morneau Pipeline, will never be built. I mean, why keep calling it after one of the executives from Enron? He's gone back to Texas now. I've been looking at, through this immense opportunity of a biannual general meeting in September of 2018 as a significant moment before we launch, as in fact we are launching here in Vancouver this weekend, everything we need to make that immense difference in 2019. We are here, we are organizing, and we are working together to share a vision. Parce que c'est la vision que c'est le, le, le chose le, le absolument primordial pour l'avenir. On doit partager une vision claire. And I think today, I have to say Adam Olson's presentation, and as Russell said, we, we heard Adam describe the origin stories of Osanich people, of his reflection on using the language of his people, Sanchothan, and thinking of the fact, and it's a fact, it's not a matter of being, it's not a poetic reflection, it's the fact of relationship, the intimate familial relationship that he expressed between his family and the whale families and the wild salmon families, and the shared origin stories from Creator. And that is a place to begin, to think how we share our vision, that it starts from an understanding that humanity is in that circle with all beings, all creatures, and reaching in all directions. That's the great medicine wheel, that's the great healing process, because where we are right now is quite broken, and healing is required. This convention has themes, which some of you might not know that the overarching theme in bringing together the speakers that you've heard was it's really time for the truth. It's time for the truth about democracy. It's time for the truth about global corporate rule. It's time for the truth about what reconciliation really means. It's time for the truth about the climate crisis. And these things bind us together in a way that you will not find in other parties. The other parties are immersed in conventional wisdom that wants to come up with election slogans that have to do with lying to people as effectively as possible given the communications tools available at the moment. They don't think of them as lies, they think of them as campaign promises, but when campaign promises are continually broken, as Grand Chief Stuart Phillips said last night, they become lies. Et les promesses de Justin Trudeau sont brisées. Les promesses de réforme électorale, les promesses de réconciliation avec les peuples autochtones, 
les promesses pour agir contre la crise du changement climatique, les promesses sont brisées. So we talk about how we're different. Everyone's always looking for us to figure out what's that thing we can go out and say in an election campaign about why we're different from all the other ones. You know, everybody wants to find this fit wedge issue stuff, which I hate. But what I realized, I was in Parliament one day thinking about the convention in the back of my mind, as it's been for many months now, what we could achieve here. And I was in Parliament and realizing that day after day, my days and my nights, I am surrounded by debates that are pointless. <laughs> I'm surrounded by debates about the latest scandal. I'm horrified by conservatives' decision to tell in graphic detail any murder that will be most traumatizing for everyone has to relive it and to talk about what's wrong with criminal justice or debates about, well, I won't, I mean, there was one night in June when due to a conservative procedural trick, we were condemned to five hours of debate on creating Canada Spanish Heritage Month. <laughs> anyway, you can go back and find my speech. In, you'll find it enhanced. So it occurred to me that what really makes us different is that we're not prepared to go into an election campaign and continue to duck the core realities that afflict our society that lead to the brokenness. We really do need to level with Canadians. We need to treat the Canadian citizenry as the group of responsible human beings and grown-ups that we know are our fellow citizens and not be afraid to talk about what's going on. I mean, how can we in Parliament blindly, time after time, vote to accept what Paul Manley was unveiling to us earlier today, what Gordon Laxer was talking about, how do we continue to accept deals that are primarily about transferring the sovereignty of nations to the powers of transnational corporations? We do it time after time without a single meaningful debate in Parliament that would suggest to me that my fellow members of Parliament have any grip whatsoever on what investor state agreements are all about. How, how do we continue to observe, and uh, recently 10 EDAs in British Columbia got together and organized a five location, I can't say five cities because one of them was Ganges, so forgive me, but five location tour for Kevin Taft, the former leader of the Liberal Party of Alberta, who has been quoted as saying, Rachel Notley may be in office, but the oil industry is in power. And he talks about the corporate capture of the regulatory agencies. So I watch this, the capture of regulators, whether it's the National Energy Board or the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency or the Canadian Food Inspection Agency or NAVCAN and on and on. The regulators are controlled by the regulated, the large industries control the regulators and their number one concern is the profit margins of the people they're supposed to regulate. And I say that recognizing the seriousness of what I have just alleged. But that's at the heart of what Thomas Homer Dixon shared with us last night. Why is it that the larger the corporate entity, the lighter the regulatory burden, the less they face anything onerous, the more they can ask for an exemption? And democracy itself. Canadians recognize there's something very wrong with the way our elections take place whether it's Doug Ford becoming premier with 40% of the vote of the 58% of the people who voted, or as Carolyn Lucas reminded us this morning, how long was, must we tolerate the abomination and the un injustice of first past the post as a voting system? we need to share with people before their eyes glaze over in British Columbia when they get to the second part of the referendum question. We need to share with people that first past the post isn't merely a system that could be improved upon. It's a system that is fundamentally dangerous at a time when the rise of alt-right populists who fool people into voting out of fear and rage, those pe first past the post is dangerous. And we cannot allow first past the post to continue to deliver 
governments that don't represent the people who voted in that election. So, if anyone disagrees, I'm happy to chat about it afterwards because when Professor Peter Russell who's a professor emeritus at University of Toronto, and he's one of the leading political scientists in this country, and he testified before the Parliamentary Committee on Electoral Reform on which I served. And he was asked by one of the members of committee, was asked, what damage has first passed the post ever done? We've had it for a long time in Canada, it's done no damage. And Peter Russell's answer was climate change. If we hadn't had first past the post, he said, we would never have seen Stephen Harper become prime minister, and we wouldn't have lost a decade for climate action. And that's true, because what we forget is, and I want to talk about how short our memories are, in 2005, we had an effective climate plan. So what I, what I feel, and I think we all share here in this room, is that first past the post as a voting system is dangerous whenever it perverts democracy by distorting the popular vote from the seat count. And it's particularly dangerous in a system like Canada's or any Westminster parliamentary democracy where there is no distinction between the executive and the legislative. With a majority of the seats, a prime minister and a, or a premier with the most seats, regardless of the popular vote, has all the power over the executive and of the legislative, which fortunately can't happen in the United States because they had a revolution, and Donald Trump has relatively less power in the United States than a prime minister in Canada has with the majority of seats. So we really need to carry this message through wherever we have a chance to get rid of first past the post, in Prince Edward Island, in British Columbia, in Ontario, everywhere across Canada. So getting back to Peter Russell's main point, which was that to tell a conservative member of parliament that the damage done by first past the post that he could point to immediately was the loss of our climate plan requires having a memory, and I do think that much of Canada suffers from collective amnesia, because the 2005 climate plan was actually pretty darn good. It was brought in under Paul Martin, Okay, he was a liberal, it was brought in with Environment Minister Stéphane Dion, it was backed up with billions of dollars, and the funny thing is that uh, as soon as, well, funny, as soon as Stephen Harper became Prime Minister, without a vote in Parliament, because of the powers that a Prime Minister has in this country, even in a minority, Stephen Harper was able to cancel that climate plan, cancel all the funding, and announce to the world that we no longer felt committed by our legally binding target under Kyoto. For a decade after that, I watched as the Conservatives and the New Democrats pretended away that plan as if it never existed, because it suited both of their political objectives to say, there's been no climate plan, the Liberals did nothing. Well, they waited an awfully long time, but we did finally get a climate plan. The interesting thing now, and this is fascinating, I never thought I'd see this, the current Liberals have pretended away as well. <laughs> they stand up and say, we're the first government to bring in a climate plan. We think, well, no, do you remember Paul Martin? He was one of your guys, no. And the reason they do that is that if anyone were to compare the 2005 climate plan with the non-plan we have today, it would be transparently obvious very quickly that Justin Trudeau has no plan to meet any target at all. The only thing that makes Justin Trudeau look good, and goodness knows on many days, as soon as Trump tweets anything, you say to yourself, well, I'm so glad I'm a Canadian, <laughs> because by comparison, and the other thing that of course makes Justin Trudeau's climate policies look good is the craven venality of the conservatives and their constant harangue against even the mildest climate action, the weakest carbon pricing. Because carbon pricing is a good thing, but on its own, it's not enough. So we come back to where 
Thomas Homer Dixon was last night when he put to us the dilemma of enough versus feasible dilemma. Or more powerfully put to me in my favorite sign on the street when my daughter and I and others were marching with 400,000 people in September 2014 for climate action, someone was holding a sign that said, it's time to stop debating what is possible and start doing what is necessary. <laughs> Which means, if we're going to start doing what's necessary, you have to start from a place of reality. You have to start by telling the truth about how serious the situation is. You have to recognize, and I'm afraid none of our national media recognizes this, that Canada's current climate target is not the Paris target. It is inconsistent with Paris. Il, est le, il reste le même, c'est le même uh, uh, but que Stephen Harper a met sur pied en mai 2015. The same target, le même cible fixé, seulement volontaire de Stephen Harper. 30% below 2005 by 2030 doesn't achieve the Paris. It's not Canada's fair share of the global effort, which must be a heroic global effort, to hold global average temperature increase to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius, and certainly not to below two. It takes us to well above three degrees Celsius, global average temperature rise. How do we talk about these things? The common wisdom is don't scare people, and people certainly must recognize that the Green Party is more than climate change. We don't want to be a one-issue party. Problem is, folks, if the one issue is survival, it's kind of the issue. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so here's the thing. There's going to be a very important dose of truth delivered soon. At least I hope it will be. It comes from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and that is an entity that operates with experts appointed by governments, and they only publish what they have decided upon by consensus. In other words, it is inherently conservative. It's inherently negotiated. It's not coming to you from Greenpeace. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was mandated during the Paris negotiations in December 2015 to do a bit of work, it's taken them three years, to provide a pathway to what the world will have to do to hold global average temperature increase to no more than 1.5 degrees. Many people have given up on it, they read the signs, they say it's not possible. But on October 8th, which happens to be Canadian Thanksgiving, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change happens to be U.S. Columbus Day. Isn't it nice they still celebrate that? Anyway, never mind. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the IPCC will be issuing its Pathway to 1.5 Degrees report. We're already seeing some early media of what we can expect. It may scare us. The scale of what we have to do is beyond anything currently underway, beyond anything any government around the world, with the possible exception of Sweden and a few others, are be or Costa Rica, are beginning to contemplate. The Minister of Environment from Norway is saying, you know, we're moving way too slow, slowly, and we have to move much faster and governments usually don't move faster and we're running out of time. So the news will be this, which I think for many of us is good news. We can still avoid 1.5 degrees Celsius. We still have a chance, but the window on that opportunity is closing and it will close between four to 12 years from now. We will not experience the worst of the worst in four to 12 years, there's a time lag. But our opportunity to save, our, save ourselves comes soon, and it comes urgently. 
Now, what I've been grappling with is where is there in the annals of human history anything like this to begin to draw on for experience, draw on for inspiration? Where is there any example in our history that we can rise to this challenge as a species and not only survive as a species, but survive as a family with all our relations, our orca relatives, our salmon relatives, our forests, our elephants, our eagles, our starlings, our starfishes. Where do we see any evidence that human nature is capable of what we're now been challenged with doing? Or to paraphrase from Thomas Homer Dixon last night, how do we deal with hope and honesty in dangerous times? It was debating in Parliament and trying to figure out how to put a question about science into 30 seconds. And by the way, a question and question period can take no more than 30 seconds. And I was trying to decide in February how I could put to my friends in the House of Commons, because I do regard them all as friends, a dose of science, because I was horrified, and Carolyn Lucas mentioned this earlier this morning, by the Arctic thaw that was making parts of Europe colder than inside the Arctic Circle, where within the Arctic Circle, the polar vortex winds had collapsed, allowing like an advancing army warm air from the south to occupy the Arctic, driving temperatures up inside the Arctic Circle to 20 degrees Celsius above average. And what I was thinking about was, because there was some news coverage, and the news coverage always wanted to show Canadians the Arctic, so we'd think about this warming because it was unprecedented. Well, it happened a couple years ago, but it's unprecedented outside of anthropogenic climate change. So, of course, what does is, what is the National do? I mean, I mean, amazing that they covered climate at all on CBC, the National, but they, they picked a, a picture of the Arctic. Sun shining down, ice melting. And that's when it hit me. There's no sun in the Arctic in January. There hasn't been sun reaching that area that's 20 degrees Celsius above average temperature for months. It's 24 hours night. It is the darkest hour. And that's when I started going all Churchillian. <laughs> and I have to apologize because there's no question that a big chunk of what I'm about to say deals with British Empire and British imperialism and colonialism but it's mostly about human nature, because this is what I started thinking about. I started thinking about the five days in May of 1940. I'd never heard of them until about four years ago. I was at an event where former Prime Minister of the UK, David Cameron, was speaking, and he was reflecting on what it was like to live in 10 Downing Street and be able to look in, and it, it was actually, if you saw the film The Darkest Hour, they put it in a basement, but it actually was in 10 Downing Street, that war cabinet room, for five days in May 1940, when Churchill deliberated with his war cabinet whether it was time to face facts and ask Mussolini to be an envoy to ask Herr Hitler if England could get good terms. By the way, parenthetically, David Cameron often wondered if it was now with social media, would anyone have given us five days? But they struggled with it, and the pressure on Churchill, he was something of an outlier, and he was not popular, was to face facts, because the facts were overwhelming, and they led in one conclusion, strike a deal, appeasement, anything but war, because the British Isle was completely defenseless against a German invasion. Not only had they not prepared for war, but the entire British army, I hadn't realized this till I started digging in, the British army, virtually every member of the British army was stranded on the beach at Dunkirk. And so, face facts. What are you going to do? Now, even then, politicians were obsessed with pop public opinion. So there were, I don't know if they were polling, but they had an information office that reported to the war office and did a daily morale report. They reported on such things as 
we've noticed increasing fatalism, and women in particular have stopped listening to the wireless. <laughs> they, on a, one day, May 19th, the Morale Today report was, quote, outwardly calm, inwardly anxious. <laughs> they also noted photographer Cecil Beaton, who took lots of pictures of the high fashion set, said, there is a mood of panic in upper class circles. Meanwhile, a member of Neville Chamberlain's cabinet, Sir Samuel Hoare, wrote this in his diary on May 18th, and I think it sums it up pretty well, quote, Neville completely knocked out. Everything finished. The USA, no good. Some things don't change, what, what, you know. Uh, we, we could never get our army out, nor if we did, it would be without any equipment. This is the end. Now, of course, I'm going to back up and say there's obvious differences between our situation now and their situation then. Obviously, climate change is not Hitler. And we don't need a Churchill particularly. What is similar, though, because, of course, a megalomaniacal, monstrous dictator is unpredictable. But the science of climate change, the chemistry of the atmosphere, is now entirely predictable. We don't have to wonder what's going to happen next. It's being laid out for us, and it's pretty clear. So as we look at this, some of the key elements remain for us to ponder. Because as we enter the epoch of the Anthropocene, where human behavior dominates the entire planet, it's pretty good time to examine human nature. What makes us tick? What does it mean when we're outwardly calm and inwardly anxious? How do humans react when an enormous danger lurks and no one wants to talk about it out loud? It increases fear. It increases anxiety. It increases a desire not to listen to the wireless anymore. The media at the time wasn't covering what was going on very much at all. But the precursor to The Guardian, which I suppose most of us here subscribe to, but it was the Manchester Guardian. And those five days in May, by the way, were May 20th to 24th. On May 24th, the Manchester Guardian editorial observed, quote, morale is not preserved by closing the eyes. The depth of the anxiety and the fear that was Fueled was fueled by soothing bromides and complacency and mindlessness. It's the same now. Canadians know that when 500 wildfires are burning in British Columbia, summer after summer, when we don't get rain for months, summer after summer, when there are wildfires in northern Ontario, when New Brunswick is being flooded, when storm surges take out areas they never hit before, People know when tornadoes rip through Ottawa that something new is afoot. And they suspect, quite rightly, that it's climate change. And when you see a report in Nature Science magazine, which came out about two weeks ago, that the Gulf of St. Lawrence, the richest marine ecosystem in Canada's ocean waters, I don't know how many Atlantic Canadians, you know what I'm talking about, the Gulf of St. Lawrence is now threatened, and scientists, including senior scientists in the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, have reported that the rapid loss of oxygen in the Gulf of St. Lawrence may destroy all marine life and in uh, the near term. The Gulf of St. Lawrence, while we're talking about our natural resource economy and taking care of provinces that have a natural resource economy, may I please remind Justin Trudeau that Newfoundland and Labrador, Quebec, Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick depend for their economy on the health of the Gulf of St. Lawrence. That's five provinces with billions of dollars of fisheries resources and billions of dollars in tourism. Canadians know that something is very wrong. So how do we react to this when our political leaders are more interested in any other topic than talking about what really is required to confront 
the climate crisis. And I believe, and the more I think about it, the more I'm sure, that standing up and saying out loud, here's the risks, we need to face reality, we need to take stock, and we need to make plans, that a clear and bold enunciation of that is our way to survival and to a flourishing and healthy biosphere. But first, let's just turn back to Churchill and Dunkirk for a minute. Because he was surrounded by all the advice, all is lost, give up, we have no soldiers, they're all stranded. There's no military way to rescue over 300,000 men stranded on the beach in Dunkirk, strafed by the Luftwaffe. Even though I know this happened as a historical fact, I have to say, when you think about it, can you really believe it happened? Because they started asking the question, what about civilian boats? You know the story. How many civilian boats are there in Dover? Well, there's 80,000 boats. Well, why don't we get those people? This is on the turn, like a 48 hour turnaround. Why don't we get those boats and ask those civilians if they're prepared to go across the English Channel, well, there is the Luftwaffe to think about, and go rescue the soldiers that are stranded at Dunkirk. How on earth did it happen? Who would have believed it was possible? Any sensible person sitting here today will say the same thing. You can't avoid 1.5. You can't rescue those guys from Dunkirk with a bunch of civilians from Dover. Face facts. But it didn't happen that way. They rescued, believe it or not, against those impossible odds, 338,226 men. Over 100,000 of them were French, by the way. Those little vo boats, volunteers. So now I look at it and I think, what would we do, all of us, in order to be sure that we give our kids a livable world? Would we get in a boat and go across from Dover to Dunkirk? You bet. There's nothing we wouldn't do. Is there anything we wouldn't do to hold each other up, to protect each other, to save all those species? We can and we will do what is necessary. The only thing standing in our way is not, we don't lack for the technology. We have everything we need right now to get Canada completely decarbonized in our electricity sector. We can completely stop using fossil fuels for electricity and then we can banish the internal combustion engine. We can plug in our vehicles and we can turn stale fat and margarine into biodiesel for the fishing boats and the tractors. It's all there. So what does our Dunkirk solution look like? Is it asking Canadians by the millions to plant more trees? Is it asking Canadians by the millions to put solar panels on their roof, to build wind turbines where they live, to have every single building in this country as energy efficient as possible, to make sure every home is not just a decent place to live, but a decent place to live that doesn't waste energy. This agenda will create millions and millions of jobs doing meaningful work. We can create what they did in the, in the US at the time when they finally got involved. My mom used to talk about her victory garden. We can plant food, we can grow local food, we can grow local healthy food. And as we do this, miracles will happen across Canada and around the world because citizens of this planet will agree with Thomas Homer Dixon. We're not prepared to tell Ben and Kate that we're a failed species. So my little idea is that candidates for the Green Party going to the next election will be prepared to lift people up, give people honest hope, convince absolutely everyone that we can and will remove the only obstacle between us and our survival, the leaders who don't want to lead. I'm asking each of you, I'm asking all of us right across the country to be prepared to work very hard, to be bold, 
to be courageous, to take heart. Last night, when the incredible speeches were over, Grand Chief Stuart Phillips stopped to say to me, you must tell every single Green, this isn't about gaining power, it's about empowerment. And if every single person in this country who understands what we're up against, the threats to our democracy, the threats of corporate rule, the threats that divide us and try to turn one against the other, if we can embrace each other, lift each other up, and present this positive view of exactly how, even though it may take some miracles, we know that the human spirit is indomitable once harnessed and that every single one of us can launch our little boat and no matter what it takes, we'll get to the other shore. We have... Thank you. I want to end. I don't, know, I don't know how this all gets messaged or what it looks like in an election campaign, but I don't think we could do better than to embrace the words from our elders who welcomed us last night. One mind, one heart. We will protect and save the future for our kids, for the orcas, for the birds, for the planet, for each other, and for all the people trying to stop us because we're generous. God bless you and thank you.